So the purpose of today's lab is to find the coefficient of friction between two materials. And the two materials that we're going to use are a cardboard box and a piece of wood. So the problem phrased in the form of a question would be, what is B specific, okay? Don't say, don't say I want to find the coefficient of friction, right? You want to find the coefficient of friction, what coefficient of friction, B specific. Now our variables, um, we always have three sets of variables. There's always going to be one manipulated variable. And as we go through this little pre-lab, the manipulated variable should become pretty clear to you, I think, what it is. So should the responding variable, I think, become pretty clear to you what it is. Now, I'm not going to tell you all the different control variables, the thousand control variables that we have. I'm not going to tell you any of them. You're going to come up with one important, well, one slash two, depending upon how you phrase it one or two really important control variables. So I'm going to put in brackets here times two, because again, depending upon how you phrase it, there might be two or there might be one control variable. Again, depending on how you phrase it. There's a million other control variables, but I don't expect you to list them. Think of this as you're doing the lab, not as we're going through the pre-lab here, but as you're doing the lab. If I changed this, it would mess everything up. Got it? If I change the temperature of the air, would it mess everything up? Probably not. Then don't list that one. Okay. If I change this, would it change everything? Yeah? All right. Then list that as your control variable or control variables. All right. What's the lab going to look like? Well, I'm going to kind of give you the materials and the procedure all at the same time. You do have to, by the way, list the materials. You do not have to list the procedure. Got it? List the materials. You do not have to list the procedure. So this is what the setup's going to look like, guys. Um, this is the floor right here. You don't have to list the floor as a, as a material, right? Like, of course it's going to be done on the floor. This is a wooden ramp right here. Now, that wooden ramp you can see is at a certain angle, a certain incline here. We're actually going to measure that angle right here. I'll tell you how to measure that angle in a few minutes here. Um, on that wooden ramp is going to be a mass set in a cardboard box. So let's say... Uh, let's call it a mass set in cardboard box. And then this thing right here, that's going to be your phone. Um, let's try to get in a group with an iPhone where somebody has an iPhone. Android might be able to do this, but I'm not familiar enough with Androids to be sure if there's this function on an Android or not. So hopefully everybody's got an iPhone or somebody in the group. We only need one. Somebody in the group has an iPhone. You're going to use what we call the Measure app. Search for the Measure app, which will measure automatically measure angles. So what we're going to do here is effectively measure the angle of the incline. And all we're going to do to do that, rather than use a protractor, is set the iPhone literally on the track. You might have to hold it so it doesn't slide down the track, right? But set it on the track. Make sense? You should make sure it's relatively calibrated first, though. So set it on a pretty flat area, pretty level area of the ground to make sure that it reads zero or one degree. If it reads one degree, if it reads one degree, then whatever angle you should get, you should subtract one from it. If it reads two degrees on the flat horizontal surface, whatever angle you get when you're measuring the angle of the incline, you should subtract two from it. Does that make sense, you guys? You want the angle of the incline, okay? Now, this mass set isn't going to be attached to this. This mass set is just going to be sitting there. You're going to start off with the ramp horizontal, and then you're going to slowly increase the angle of the ramp until the mass start be set begins to move. When the mass set begins to move, you want to measure that angle. You got that? Not after the mass set begins to move, but when the mass set begins to move. So if you find that it starts moving at 31 degrees and you kept going to 33 degrees, you don't want to record the 33, you want to record the 31 degrees, the angle at which it began to move. That's the time when we overcame the force of static friction, the maximum force of static friction. Does that make sense? This block of masses is just sitting there. There's static friction, and that static friction increases okay, as, I, as I increase the incline. But at some point, I overcome the maximum force of static friction. That's just how I'm going to measure that maximum force of static friction. So trial number one, you're going to set a mass set there. You're going to set your phone there. You're going to increase the angle until it begins to move. You're going to record the angle, the angle at which it begins to move. So record the mass in kilograms. 
record the angle, theta, at which it begins to move in degrees. Then, what I want you to do is change the mass. Make it a different mass and do it again. And then change the mass again and do it again. And change the mass again and do it again. We'd like to have 10 trials, but where I've never done this one before, I'm not sure how many different combinations of masses you're going to be able to do to make it work. The bottom line is the bigger the mass, the better it's going to work. So you don't want to use like 20 grams. You're not, this isn't going to work if you use 20 grams. So use big combinations. And if you only get six or seven data points because of the various combinations we can try with the mass sets, I can live with that. The more data points, the better, but at least six or seven with big masses. Got it? So six or seven or 10 different masses, and then six or seven or 10 corresponding angles at which it begins to move. Now, how is this going to give us the coefficient of friction? Well, we're going to plot a graph, but it's not going to be theta versus the mass. We're going to have to find two new variables. We're going to have to find the normal force in newtons and FSF max also in newtons. Well, how are we going to find those variables? You know how to find those. You know how to find the normal force and the maximum force of static friction. Look, here's your box. Here's the force of gravity, which is m times g. Here's the normal force acting at 90 degrees. This is F parallel. Now, if you measure the angle at which it begins to move to be 30 degrees, then this angle would be 30 degrees, and this angle would also be 30 degrees. You can find F parallel, and F parallel will correspond to the max force of static friction when it begins to move, right? So find F parallel by saying sine 30 degrees is equal to F parallel over Fg, the mass times gravity. Solve for F parallel, which will correspond to FSF max. Remember the force you have to apply to overcome friction? We also have to find the normal force. The normal force, uh, we're going to say cosine 30 degrees is equal to, look, the adjacent over the hypotenuse. When you fill in these columns here for normal force and FSF max, which, by the way, FSF max is just F parallel, because remember, F parallel, or sorry, the applied force at which the force that we have to apply to overcome static friction is the max force of static friction. F parallel is the force that's being applied to overcome static friction. So it is static friction. So when you calculate those, fill in these columns, show this work. Show me the example calculations for F parallel and Fn, and show me this diagram as well. You can draw that out by hand and take a picture and just copy and paste it into your, to your lab. You don't have to do it on uh, Google Docs, but it needs to be in that same document. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, FSF max uh, is, is uh, F parallel, and that's going to be using sine here. So F normal, the normal force, is using cosine. Okay. All right. So now, now we've got the data that we're going to use to plot our graph. We're going to plot FSF max on the y-axis, and we're going to plot Fn, the normal force, on the x-axis. And you should get uh, relatively close to a straight line. And when you get that straight line, you want to draw a trend line, like we always do when we have a straight line, right? And you're going to display the equation, like we always do when we get a straight line. And then we're going to do something with that. But what? How are we going to find the coefficient of friction from this? The equation that describes this graph is y equals mx plus b, because it's a straight line. The y-axis is fsf max. m is the slope of the graph, and x is fn, the normal force. What does b stand for? 
yeah, the y-intercept, and there isn't going to be a y-intercept here, or at least it's going to be really, really small, small enough that we can pretend that it's zero. Okay, so my equation for this graph is F force of static friction is equal to the slope times the normal force. We have an equation from class that says FSF max is equal to mu times the normal force. All right. Well, if S, if the force of static friction is the slope times the normal force, and the force of static friction is mu times the normal force, then the slope of the graph is equal to mu. What were we trying to find? The coefficient of static friction. If we take the slope of this graph, then we've got the coefficient of static friction. Does that make sense? Show all this work. Show all this work. Okay, don't just give me a number for the coefficient of friction. And don't do like, if you have 10 data points, don't do 10 calculations for, for mu. You do one. Your mu comes from the slope of the graph. Remember we talked about this after your last graph, right? Or after your last lab. You have one calculation for mu here. The whole point of getting multiple data points and plotting a graph was to effectively average those points. So we're not going to say, we're not going to use this and this 10 different times to find 10 different coefficients. We're going to use the graph, the slope of the graph, to find the coefficient once. Then, of course, your conclusion is, well, what is the coefficient of static friction? And then justify it. So how do you know? Basically, briefly, briefly summarize what we just did. Okay? Basically, you're saying, look, I, my coefficient of friction is 0 0.62. And I know this because where'd you get it from? Right? Where'd you get that coefficient of friction from? Two short sentences are sufficient for that. And then, of course, your sources of error. Two or three good sources of error plus corresponding suggestions for improvement. Does that make sense, you guys?